um, and that's really important to be able to recognize. So it's just struck 10 a.m. Um, it's great to see everybody online. Um, we are here again today. My name is Hannah, the community educator at the Hopland Research and Extension Center, and I have Ali joining me again. Ali, you want to say hi? Hi, welcome back everyone. So glad that you all could make it for our second day. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're actually going to be able to turn today to the um, physics of fire. And we are going to be demonstrating the lessons in that learning cycle that does involve actually experimenting with fire. So you're going to see us doing that um, remotely a little bit today and thinking about the safety associated with it. We're also very lucky that we're going to be joined um, by Dr. Kate Wilkin, who is the Assistant Professor of Fire Ecology at San Jose State University. And she was also the original, she's waving there, hey Kate, she was also the original kind of inspiration and PI for this grant, Ali and um, Kate particularly. Um, and so she's played a crucial role in education around fire um, uh, throughout throughout the time I've been working here and I know before that as well. So Kate, we'll come to you in just a few minutes, but thank you for being here with us today. <laughs> so before we do move on to that, I do just want to spend a few minutes. Um, this is something I've always done when I am starting to work with students um, on these fire lessons is, oh, thanks Ali. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to get our poll started. This is just the same as we did the other day, so if you guys wouldn't mind just letting us know how confident you feel teaching your students about fire physics. This really helps us for the grant as well to have a sense of how you might um, have built on your experience after our training today and your learning. Just give you a minute to complete that. Everybody, maybe just another one or two people just finishing their poll it would be great to get your feelings about how confident you feel. That's super. Okay, so um, let's have a quick look at what people. Okay, I see Mark saying he couldn't see the poll. Mark, I'll connect with you afterwards and we can add your information into the poll. Thank you. Um, so what we're seeing is that people are feeling between somewhat and moderately confident and a few who feel very confident, which is great. And we would love your input as we have our discussion today. I think that's one of the real values of a quite a small class is that we can have some discussion too. Okay. So um, to get us started, what I'd love to do is in the chat, if you could write three words that come to mind for you when you hear the words fire. And it could be any kind of fire. So three things, it might be feelings, it might be just words that come to mind, it really doesn't matter. We're, you know, big thinking here. Three things that come to mind for you when you hear the word fire. And if you could just stick those in the chat. Great, excellent. So um, these are wonderful, thanks you guys. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of things here, I'm just gonna read them out. See, warm, control, danger, heat, light, energy, warmth, beautiful, home, warming, preparation, go bag, forest, camping, warmth, marshmallows, summer, terror, Fear, hot, run, community, food, run, smoke, help, s'mores, evacuate, and clearing. So um, I think when you look at those words, and this is fairly typical of any group I've worked with and, and with the students as well, s'mores is always in there, I've noticed, which is really critical, right? Um, we have lots of different experiences with fire. And it can provide a very comforting and community related place for us and always has done for humans. And it can also be terror, a, a feeling of fear and terror. And 
those things exist. It's the same thing we're talking about, right? We're talking about fire and our relationship to it. So as we talk about fire today, let's bear that in mind and let's be aware that people are having all of these strong emotions. And so with a group of students, we won't get to do this today, but with a group of students, maybe we'll cover this a little bit more tomorrow. What I would then move on to is how are we going to talk about fire in a way that we do feel safe? And we'll work on starting to create some ground rules so that we can do that. And um, so I'll throw out to the students, what ground rules do you think we should have to um, have this conversation and feel safe? So maybe, you know, since we do have just a minute or two, does anybody have an idea? How can we um, talk about fire today and tomorrow, but make sure that we all feel safe as we're talking about it? Any suggestions? And you can take yourselves off mute. That would probably be the easiest. Making sure that we validate that everyone's feelings are valid. Great. So in a classroom, I'd be getting this up on the whiteboard, right? Everybody's feelings are valid. Um, excellent. And recognizing we have very different feelings. Uh, anybody else want to add anything? Any other ground rules? No, that all questions are okay. Great. Yeah, we're open to all questions here. Nothing is a bad question. We're open to all of those today. That's excellent. Uh, I think, Tricia, did you have something to add? Yeah, in, in kid words, just no put downs. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And as you say, everybody's feelings validated. And then kid words, that might just be no put downs. That's great. I had a student um, I was working with just before coronavirus and I was in the classroom and we went through this process and I was amazed at what they brought up. And one of the students um, raised their hand and said, you know, when I'm feeling scared about something, I often make jokes. And I thought, wow, how insightful. And so we agreed as a community of classroom that um, even though there might be times when um, we felt like it, we wanted to make a joke about something, we'd give it, we'd kind of think about it twice. And um, before we said it, we'd make sure that that wasn't gonna make somebody feel upset. Um, I also underlined that we were still supposed to be having fun, right? So we were talking about a subject which um, does bring up strong feelings, but crucially, these lessons should also provide a great deal of fun. Anybody want to add any other ones to our ground rules or do we? Yeah, one of the things I used to always share with my students, I taught middle school and junior high school for 30 years. So wow, um, I've been 13 forever. Um, <laughs> the, ability to, the ability to put your hand on your own body and just breathe into it, to feel what you're feeling is okay. And I used to encourage that when kids would get real scared. Yeah, I think that's really important. That's um, something, again, we're going to cover more tomorrow is how we've considered um, trauma-informed education models to create some of this these lessons. Um, but the other thing that I would normally go into when working with students, just at this point, just as I kind of go in the classroom, we go through this feelings about fire and we talk about ground rules, is to then think about what signs of anxiety do we each individually express? Because we all have it differently, right? Um, for me, it's um, short breaths and struggling to get my words. But for somebody else, it's going to exhibit in a different way. And so for the kids to be able to share what, how they feel when they're feeling a little bit nervous is really helpful. And then to say, if you start feeling those things, then like you say, Gay, taking a deep breath, maybe some simple breathing exercises that I know tomorrow will go into a little bit more. Um, but also recognizing times when, okay, this room is not the place that you should be right now. Um, this is not a situation in which you should be putting yourself right now. Okay, um, so I want to move on at this point. Um, let me just get the right lesson plan here. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Kate. As I say, um, Kate Wilkin, PhD, is the Assistant Professor of Fire Ecology at San Jose State University um, and, and was crucial in the creation of um, this grant that we got to um, tweak these lessons around fire, uh, particularly for the Oak Woodlands. Um, so Kate's going to share with us half an hour now about the situation we're currently in with fire in California. Thank you, Kate, for being with us. Hi everyone, how are you all doing this morning? 
We're all muted, knowing we are some of us. Oh, maybe we can. <laughs> um, um, so I'm new to participating with you all in this group, and I would just love to hear um, your your name and where you are calling in from this morning, and also your role in the community where you might use fireworks, just so that I kind of understand where you all are coming from, so I can try to speak more directly to you. Okay, well, my name is Gay Henry. Um, I'm a member of the Anderson Marsh Interpretive Association in beautiful Lake County, right on Clear Lake. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm involved, uh, I was a retired educator, but now I'm involved as a volunteer and I work with lots of students and schools uh, in field trips and stuff like that. Okay. My name is Stephanie Barrett and I'm in Southern California. Riverside specifically, and I am a 4-H um, program representative, so I have a lot of opportunities to use this with our 4-Hers. Awesome. I'm Henry Bornstein. I'm, all, I'm from Lake County. Uh, like Gay, I am uh, the same organization. I lead the school field trips uh, and uh, guided nature walks for students and the public at Anderson Marsh State Historic Park. My name is uh, Stephen Baptista, and I am a uh, high school science teacher at Tioga High. It's a small rural high school just north of Yosemite, and I'll be teaching a forestry and natural recourse, resource course this year, and uh, fire science is a large portion of that curriculum. I'm Trisha Dunlap. I work in the same county as Stephen. I'm the STEM consultant for the Tuolumne County uh, Superintendent of Schools Office. I'm Meredith Zalusha. I teach sixth grade. Um, this is my first year actually teaching sixth grade science. I'll be doing multiple subject. Um, and I've been to a couple of workshops at HERC about prescribed fire on private land. And I'm trying to be involved in the Mendocino Burn, Prescribed Burn Association. I'm Haley. I am in Alameda County and I work with preschoolers, but I was interested in this as a resource to share uh, with other teachers and I have colleagues who work with different um, age groups. So I was just sort of getting more information for my own self and hopefully have resources to share. Hey, and I think that's everyone. So, so nice to meet you all here this morning. My name hey, is- I'm just gonna add, I see a couple of folks in the chat that it might be nice for you to hear from. Sherry Mace is a UC Cooperative Extension in Mariposa. I'm a community educator for fire in Mariposa, Merced, Madeira, and Fresno counties. I'm Ramon Billy is the um, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer of the Hopland Band of Pomo Indians, and also was an advisor on um, some of the elements of our grant this time. Uh, and, um, Meredith said she couldn't remember if I mentioned I teach in Ukiah Unified. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you got those ones too. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I need to remember um, to pay attention to the chat window. This is kind of a dry run for me. I'm going to be teaching a 200 person lecture online. Um, and so I'm practicing some of my techniques. You all might notice my lighting. Very professional. Totally. <laughs> I'm also trying to practice um, making eye contact with you through the screen. Good, and you'll probably need a, uh, a chat monitor when you do this. To help right, no, unfortunately, the university won't provide a facilitator even for large lectures. Now you just get somebody that you're into to say, hey, do this for me, please. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think you're correct. Because <laughs> it's, it's hard to multitask. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I want to tell you just a little bit about myself. My name is Kate Wilkin, and I first became interested in fire in Florida, um, where I worked for the Nature Conservancy, and I came to California for graduate school, and I went to San Luis Obispo on the Central Coast. I worked in Yosemite for many years um, as a fire effects monitor and botanist, and then I went back to school at Berkeley for my PhD um, and went on to work for UC Cooperative Extension as a regional fire advisor, and I just started a new position at San Jose State as an assistant professor of fire ecology. Um, so I've gotten to know different parts of the state and um, really from the lens of fire and plants. And so um, I would really appreciate your patience um, as I might try to use some new techniques to me like trauma-informed education. 
I would really appreciate it. Um, so I was asked to speak today about why do we have such a fire problem in California? Because we're in the Mediterranean climate and just like Greece, we get fires in the summer. Correct. So that's definitely it dries out. It dries out. And we get those, we get those winds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, why do we have this fire problem? It's obvious we have this huge fire problem. I think we all feel it on a very personal level and also on an existential kind of greater California level. And, you know, it's one of those especially wicked problems, because I think if we could say it was, you know, this or that, I really think that we could solve it. But because it is complex and there are so many factors that go to solving it, it's become a, a wicked problem that's been really difficult for us to solve. So if you all could, um, let's use the chat window again. So why don't you all write down in the chat window why you think we have this problem here in California. If everyone could write a few things down, it would be great. And Hannah, can you confirm to me with a thumbs up or thumbs down that I'm sharing my screen? Okay. Looks great, Kate. Great, I think everyone has written answers in. Are people still writing? I see some people concentrating, so they must be writing. <laughs> and so I see lots of really great ideas about why we have a fire problem here in California. And honestly, I think that they're you know, all part of the problem. I'm just gonna kind of read them off. Decades of fire suppression, human intervention, fire suppression, ignoring indigenous knowledge, more and more people living in the wildland urban interface, heavy fuel loading in many habitats, like forests, chaparral, oak woodlands, and understory fuels, ignorance about land management techniques, disregard for land management practices and traditions, a dry, a dry and changing climate, an illogical, an illogical approach to fire management and climate, the wind blows, fires down canyons to the ocean. If the winds don't stop, the fires don't stop. And prolonged drought. And so what I just learned is you all could be giving this lecture for me. <laughs> you all are obviously a really um, well-educated group of Californians who are, really have a strong grasp of fire here in California. So how about, we'll talk about some of these reasons and the support that we have for them to understand them as a reason why we have such a wicked fire problem here in California. And so one thing I often hear, especially last year and the year before, um, you know, was why do we have such a fire problem? And especially after the 2017 and the 2018 fire seasons, everyone said it's PG and E because those were the large wind-driven fires that we had experienced, especially in Northern California. And what I wanna say is that, you know, we, the people of California, actually start about 85% of fires here. So if you're just looking at the number of fires that we start. And the other thing that I wanna share is that the, um, the amount, it's not just the amount of ignitions that we have, but it's also the length of fire season. So this here is an example from Southern California. We unfortunately don't have a good paper yet out for Northern California, but this tells you just about um, the proportion of fires and how they start. And so for the top graphic on the top right, graph A, this is from the Santa Monica Mountains. And you can see here that on the left is the proportion of fires and the bottom is the different types of ignitions. 
And you can see here that in the Santa Monica Mountains that in fact arson. Can you see my pointer when I put it over here? Can you, yes? Okay, great, that's it. I learned about that in my online teaching class yesterday. Um, you can see arson obviously really swamps most of the fire ignitions in the Santa Monica Mountains. But if you look down at the bottom right graph to San Diego County, what I see is that you know equipment potentially like PG&E power lines or, or power lines and equipment like bulldozers and welding are the types of things that really start start fires in this region. So you can see that there are regional differences and that really speaks to the idea that it would be great if somebody were to do a similar paper for Northern California so we could understand how fires start in California. Another reason people often point to for why we have so many fires here in California is climate change. And people often look at how there's this really strong trend here in California, where if you look at how fires have changed in the past you know, 50 years, you see a gradual increase of fire through time. And it's interesting because this actually correlates fairly well with climate change. But as you all, as many of you all know, this is a really short snapshot of history in California. And you know, this does co correlate with climate change. It looks at you know, warming periods and earlier springs, we see an increase in wildfire in California and research does support that. But you know, I think that's really only part of the story. We need to go a little deeper in time. And what many of you all wrote in the chat box is that you all know that people in California used to use fire quite a bit. In addition to people, we also had a lot of lightning strike ignitions that burned large portions of California. And so historically, we had almost 2 million acres of fire a year in the state. When you compare that to how many acres we have today, or even how many acres burned you know, during 2017 or 2018, during some of our really awful fire years recently, you realize that, you know, wow, those historic fires probably did a lot to stop the types of fires that we had today. You know, they consumed a lot of fuels and created fire breaks across huge parts of the landscape. And I actually can't see the chat window right now, Hannah, if you're chatting. So I need to turn that on, right? So, um, Kate, I'll check in with you when we have questions in the chat, but I just noticed that Meredith had a question saying, clarifying question, this is wildfire only, correct? And I was just gonna say that's indeed the case. So I'll keep you up to date with any times that we have questions there. Oh, and so actually for this graph here, it includes prescribed fire, but in California, prescribed fire, while there's lots of us who are very excited about using it, um, it's just a drop in the bucket. It's really sad how few acres we burn every year. It's pathetic. Okay. Yeah, and so in 2017, we only had 1.4 million acres burned. So not even close to historic numbers, but it was very different. That was in, in 2017, it was a lot of fires that moved through um, areas that had not had fire in quite a long time. And so we saw huge flame lengths, and a lot of heat that likely killed a lot of vegetation. Historically, those fires would have been on the ground. One thing that I think is really interesting um, is that research shows that humans trigger fire regime chains. For better or for worse, we do it. And so this graph is complex, and I'm gonna try to walk you through it. So take a breath with me here. So um, this graph here on the bottom uh, axis across here, you see years. That's the simplest one to explain. So we'll start there. Um, so this is years through time from 1600 all the way to 2000. On the left, left vertical axis is it fire index, which tells you, you know, how much fire activity there is. And those are the two that I really, you know, want to look at with you all um, to begin with. And as we look across this graph from left to right, you see lots of little bars. Do you all see the bars? Okay, and the, that's the level of fire activity in each of those years. And there's a statistical analysis to look at that activity and that's this red line here. And so, what I want you all to recognize is that 
that through time, fire activity has changed. That's the first um, take home point from this graph. The second take home point from this graph is that we have these distinct time periods. And those are indicated with these black lines here. These are distinct time periods in our fire history where fires acted very differently. So looking at this first time period here, um, could people maybe write in the chat window, what time, what do you think is distinct about this first time period from about 1600 until about 1775? A few more ideas. Great. And so what we see here um, from 1600 till about 1775 is that really fire in California is likely dominated by um, forces that actually pull um, fire relationship apart from the climate. And so what we're seeing here is that fairly like low levels of like fire activity, but it's not quite the right word. Um, what I'm trying to say is during this time period, it was likely that fire was dominated by native Californians and also lightning. And during this time period, um, fire and climate were apart. They weren't aligned. They were apart. And then for the next time period, from about 1775 until about 1875, we see a change. What happened during this period? Anybody typing in your chat window? So industrialization, colonizers, we had the gold rush. We had dramatic depopulation of our Native Americans, Native Californians. And so what we see during this time period is that we see an increase of fire activity. And also it actually becomes more linked to climate because when there is a fire, it's because of a high wind event, a dry event, a hot event. It was like you know, an accident that got something started. So maybe a, a new railway had a spark or they were welding something and it sparked and it was on a hot, dry, gusty day and that just took off. So it wasn't when we had likely had fires historically. And then we have this other period, a more modern period here. Again, where fire activity is lower, but also, and again, it's also decoupled from climate. And so what I think is really interesting about this in the more recent time periods, and one of the reasons it's decoupled from climate is that we have so much fuel on the ground, it doesn't matter really what day it gets ignited. We have a tinderbox, it's ready to go. And so we've set it up for the perfect disaster. And so that's why today when you look at fire in California, um, there's very little link between fire activity and climate. And so I always kind of, I'm always uncertain and every fire season, I get calls from reporters and um, people from the fire department get called from, from reporters and say, what is your prediction for this fire season? Based on the weather this winter or this or that. And I always say, it's gonna be awful no matter what. You know, we're in California and we've set ourselves up for disaster. It doesn't matter what the weather is, has been so far. We're, it, we're in an awful place today, no matter what. Um, but. But overall, the, the real message I want you all to take from this graph is that, you know, fire has changed in California. Fire has changed in California in relationship to human populations. Humans have buffered the relationship between fire and climate. Um, and so, you know, we have the ability to change our relationship with fire here in California yet again. We just have to take the step to do that.
So another reason people often say about why we have such a, a fire problem here in California is land management. And you know, if we just took care of natural areas, we would not have a fire problem. Okay, can I just um, check in? So I have a question from Tricia asking, are you using climate and weather as synonyms? I may have mixed up my language there and thank you for pointing that out. So overall, you know, our climate is getting drier and warmer. And so we, we do have more extreme fire days now because of climate change every season and our seasons are longer. Um, but also weather wise, it doesn't matter what happens to our weather. If, if it was a wet winter or a dry winter, um, we have enough fuel on the landscape that it will be dry come fall and will be, it could burn. Does that make more sense? Great, thank you so much, Hannah. That really makes me um, think I need a facilitator. Yeah. In my lecture class. <laughs> <Anytime>. <laughs> yeah. Um, so land management. You know, if we just took care of our fire problem, we wouldn't have such a fire problem. If we just took care of our land, we wouldn't have such a fire problem. And you know, here is an example um, of a fuel break. So here in the left panel is what it looked like before a fuels reduction treatment. And here on the right is after a fuels reduction treatment. And what I can say is that, you know, fuel breaks like this that are maybe along roadways or important infrastructure or rivers, you know, they can help moderate fire, but only if we're not experiencing severe winds. And they can be a point, a tactical point for firefighters to really get a hold of a fire. But again, only if it's not during incredibly severe fire weather, if we're not having winds and it's extremely hot and dry. And so while these are really important features on our landscape, especially for evacuation and safety, um, they're not going to solve the problem. You know, we really need to be moving away from thinking about these linear features that run along something that's important to really thinking about treating the whole landscape. And this is because, you know, we live in California. It's a Mediterranean climate. It was meant to burn. We have these long, hot, dry summers that just get longer and drier as it goes into the fall, especially with climate change. And all of our plants and animals here were actually adapted to fire. And so, you know, maybe we could learn a thing or two from them about how we can adapt to fire as well. We can also learn quite a bit from the first Californians. Here in this photograph or this drawing, Laura Cunningham is a paleoecologist and an artist. And here she shows a Miwok man burning Bay Tidal Marsh in her recent book, From a State of Change. And you know, looking at trends um, throughout California, looking at oral histories and fire history records, you know, we can really have a really a good understanding of how these first Californians burned in our state. You know, people um, often burned larger areas like this person is doing here, but they would also burn smaller areas. Here is a woman collecting basketry materials, and this was an area where they may have maybe burned a smaller area to promote berries and shoots so that they could, you know, use these resources. And, you know, Shoots, especially from hazelnut and sourberry, redbud and buckrush, really all provided wonderful basketry materials. You know, and so as I said before, sometimes individual plants were set on fire to promote these straight shoots, and other times it was patches or even large areas. You know, some areas were dramatically influenced by Native Americans, and others weren't. And so here is a drawing of Yosemite Valley in the late 1800s. Um, and looking at Albert Bernstadt's interpretation of this, what I see is an open orc orchard where I can see wall to wall up and down the valley. Um, but, and what I think is really interesting about this is that you can see that the walls of Yosemite Valley are so steep. And that actually ultimately means that lightning strikes have a very difficult time of reaching the valley floor. And in fact, during the past 100 years, since people have been keeping really good records about that, no lightning strikes have actually reached the valley floor. They've reached the walls every once in a while. But likelihood of that starting fire on the valley floor is very small. In fact, Yosemite Valley was maintained in this way through pyro agriculture. And today, we know that Yosemite Valley looks incredibly different without that influence. 
And so here is an example, Yosemite Valley, where the landscape was dramatically shaped by burning. Um, but in other areas further away from human population centers and in other landscape types, we also can recognize that potentially there was less influence of human ignition and maybe lightning strikes, especially at higher elevations, were more of a dominant factor. And so, you know, looking at Yosemite Valley today, you know, the park and the Yosemite Miwok all recognize that th things needed to change. And so, you know, while this is a picture you may have seen in Yosemite Valley five years ago, they've been working to restore the oak orchards together. And one of the ways that they're doing that is by bringing fire back into the valley. And they're using prescribed fire and also in other areas of Yosemite, they're using prescribed natural fire. And so here on the left is Harold Biswell. He was one of the first kind of pyromaniacs in California academics. Um, and he's um, working on a prescribed fire here. And you can see, you know, it looks very timid. Like I might let my toddler play with it. Um, and this looks very different than a lot of the photographs that we see of fire today. And then it was interesting to me because Harold Biswell here pictured was had the nickname Harry the Torch Biswell because he recognized the importance of fire in our ecosystems and he really tried to speak for them. And he would tell other people about the importance of fire and they laughed at him. And he wasn't allowed into faculty meetings. He was, people ignored him at Berkeley. Uh, when he would go to Yosemite to speak to the Rangers, people threw spitballs at him. They walked out of the room. They really ignored him. But ultimately, um, the students who worked with Harry at Berkeley went on to be really um, thought leaders in the field of land management in California. And they went on to not only guide a lot of the prescribed prior efforts, efforts on public lands, but they also um, helped guide this idea of let it burn or prescribed natural fire, where people allow lightning strike fires to burn in more wilderness areas. Quick question. Um, number one, I'm worried his shoes are gonna get burned right there in that picture. Uh -huh. <laughs> I can't believe on this side, he's standing, wow. And number two, um, what year was he you know, preaching his fire message? 40s, 30s to 50s. 30s to, so that's, that was right at the same time of the, like the big fires in Colorado where firefighters were killed and stuff and they were decided fire's bad. Is that the same so, um, timeline? I think people decided that fires were bad probably around 1910. There was the okay. big blow up. And then right. the Forest Service instituted a 10 a.m. policy pretty early, right. where they tried to have every okay. fire out by 10 a.m. So this was decades after those policies. This was a few decades after. later. Yeah. Okay. And even much longer after, you know, Native Amer Native um, American burning had been taken off the landscape. Okay. So you, he could really see the early effects of the lack of fire. Okay. It Kate, I'd also just like, now I am aware that what you're sharing is really, really important information and I don't want to cut it short, um, but we're moving to the end of your time period and I know I want some time for questions as well. So um, Ali and I will shift things around a little bit on our end, um, mm -hmm. but maybe in about 10, 15 minutes, do you think we could be finishing up? Thank you for the time check. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, and so ultimately, you know, Harry Biswell recognized that fire is this really important ecological concept, that it consumes vegetation and recycles nutrients, it selects for different adaptations, like seeds that can only germinate after fire, whether because the fire breaks the seed coat and allows them to mechanically come out of the seed, or because it, the fires leave bare mineral soil and that's what the seeds need. Fires also alter community composition and assembly. You may have heard of pioneer species that are very common after fire. It also can alter and create biomes. And so, you know, there's a lot of thought that C4 grasslands actually started because of fires, because fires ate away at the forest and allowed these C4 grasslands to become common. Um, and so, you know, fire has dramatically shaped our ecosystems, and it's a very important thing to think about. However, you know, this idea that plants need fire and, you know, without fire, it's going to be awful. 
um, this idea can actually really be overplayed because it, it's about the specific fire regimes, the type, how frequently you had fire and the type of fire you had. And so fire is not the solution to fire everywhere. Um, so prescribed fire in some places just doesn't make sense. I'm gonna put a timer on here so I can be mindful and respectful of your all's time. Okay. Um, and so here on this graphic, from Max Moritz, they were looking at how much fire is happening in California relative to historic amounts. And so I think you all can recognize the shape of California here. Um, and where I see the blue colors, the cool colors, those are parts of the state where we have too little fire. And the parts that are warm are areas where we actually have too much fire. If this um, study had been done today, I think that Lake um, and the southern portion of Mendocino County would end up being areas that were also warm, as in having too much fire. And so, you know, looking across the state, to me, this means that there are, depending on where you are, there's different solutions that need to be prioritized for fire. And so just, you know, speaking to some of these areas that may have had like too much fire, and one of the areas that we work in and we're talking about today are oak woodlands. And oak woodlands are a system that's interesting to me because while they could have had very, um, a wide variety of fire frequencies, um, we know that grass grows back every year, sometimes after a fire, um, sometimes even within a week. And so just thinking that, you know, grass grows back and it can burn every year, but just because grass in our native California oak woodlands has that ad adaptation, it doesn't mean that that was the fire frequency of this fire regime. And that's something that you all, all um, really try to tease apart in, a, in another lesson. What was the fire regime of these oak woodlands? And so thinking about, you know, fire in California, um, you know, the, I think the use of prescribed fire is incredibly important. And through my work with the University of California, you know, I've led a number of grants about using prescribed fire on private lands, and I'm continuing that research and work today at San Jose State. But I also recognize that prescribed fire isn't necessarily important everywhere. And I see a question here that there's also a lot of na non-native grasses that burn differently, correct. Um, but even our native perennial grasses could ha can, can handle annual burning. They burn very, very differently because during the fall drought period, they, they have still have fuel moisture and they're discontinuous because they're, they're bunch grasses, they're clumped. Um, and the non-native grasses are annuals and they form a continuous layer that gets to be quite dry in the fall. And again, that's something I think you all are going to talk about later. But anyways, there's lots of um, other things we could do, use for, besides prescribed fire to try to kind of like get our systems back on track for areas that have not had enough fire. So that includes things like targeted grazing, timber harvest, mastication, which is a piece of heavy machinery with these big rotator or claws in the front that actually kind of eat, eat up and shred the material, targeted browsing, and also thinning a forest from below. And you know, I want you all to know that I'm a really strong advocate for prescribed fire, but I recognize that we can't use it everywhere. You know, I'm, I'm such an advocate that I helped start two prescribed burn associations when I was with UC, but that's just a piece of the puzzle. You know, we need to really be open-minded to think about how far we've pushed our ecosystems off track and how can we get them back to, the, to where they were. And that I don't think it's gonna be a clear linear line. We can't use fire to get back. We're gonna to have to use, maybe in some cases use something more aggressive. So, you know, we have this major problem that we need to fix. We have a California wildfire crisis and then we also have a mixed conifer forest crisis. And these are two crises that are happening simultaneously. Um, and so they have different, solutions. Sometimes they're similar, but sometimes they're slightly different. You know, so ultimately, I kind of feel like we can't be purist at this point because we've pushed the system too far. Another thing to think about for this fire problem in California is our wildland urban interface and where we have people living in California. And so one of these factors is defensible space. And in California, in the state responsibility areas, um, we know that we have regulations in the state to have defensible space. And these regulations have been successful to help reduce the amount of loss that we've seen. So here's a report from the campfire 
Um, and what I see here is that buildings before 2008 were much more likely to be destroyed during the campfire than buildings that were built after 2008. And so what we see is that, you know, these regulations that California has were helpful. Um, but I would argue um, that having 40% of those buildings destroyed means that we probably didn't go far enough with those regulations. So that's still um, far too many to suffer. Um, and so, you know, in California, you know, we have new regulations after the 2018 fire season that should help with some of these ideas. Um, but I would probably argue they did not go far enough. Um, it, had they gone far enough, they would be following the recommendations of FireWise USA and NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection Association. This image here um, and this idea is based on research from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. And here they think that every house should have an area around the house and the deck and in the garage, around the garage, um, of five feet that has no fuel or very limited fuel. And so that's not something that's regulated in California, unfortunately. Um, but I think, you know, new research, especially at the campfire, shows that that's important. And there's some language, but it's not as highly regulated. Um, and so this could be one area where I think that you all, as people who are speaking to, to school groups, could potentially help people understand what the next step is and also how to use science. Another area is land use planning. So the idea that maybe more people live in our wildland urban interface. Um, here we have community scale planning, the way neighborhoods are situated, an individual lot and an individual building. So these are all the different ways that we can try to regulate home loss or the reduction of home loss. So one, individual buildings would be following the latest scientific recommendations and improving our California regulations. For an individual lot, it might be um, the defensible space and how it's situated on that lot to give it more of a setback from a steep hill. For a neighborhood, um, it would be about having a road surrounding the neighborhood and green space so that the neighborhood could have its own fire break, both for evacuation and also to reduce the amount of structure loss. And then finally, at the community scale, where you might consider having agricultural areas surrounding urban areas. So here's an example, an example of the individual lot scale, where here, the house, had the house been right here on the steep hill, um, which is where I had purchased a house um, because of the beautiful view, um, you know, this is where the flame lengths are really quite long. But if the house is set back 30 or 100 feet, what we see is that it, the, those flames don't come as close to the house and it's much more protected. Another idea that can be incorporated into land use planning are these ideas, you know, where do you go in the last resort when you cannot evacuate? And so in Butte County, they understood that they had these horrible winds. Those Jarbo Gap winds are intense and they're always gonna be intense. And they've been intense before and they've caused horrible fires and people had trouble evacuating. Um, and so they had actually had a wildfire safety zone where people could assemble. And I, my timer went off, Hannah, so I'm aware that I need to wrap up. Um, and so here people assembled during the campfire. They had done it before and they were protected by firefighters um, as they kind of shuffled around the, the margins of the meadow that had been reinforced, I guess you could say, or they'd done more fuel treatments around to help make it safer for people. And so that's something that could be in every neighborhood. You know, firefighters are not supposed to be anywhere on a fire where they don't have a safety zone. So it's, it makes sense to me that you wouldn't have your family sleep anywhere where they don't have a safety zone. If a firefighter shouldn't do it, then neither should your family. Um, and, you know, there are other places in California where this is more common, like Rancho Santa Fe, and we can share some more information from you all. So ultimately, what I want to say to you all today is that there's many ways and many reasons that we have a fire problem in California. It's wicked. We know it deals with land management. It deals with climate change. It deals with land use planning and codes, and probably more things that I haven't even talked about, um, because I'm sure that there's more that I don't understand yet. And so... You know, there's lots of reasons here, and it's a hard problem to solve, but ultimately I think that, you know, every Californian needs to work on these solutions. And that's actually one of the reasons I'm really committed to fireworks, is that I think every native, everybody who lives in California, every California resident 
you know, should understand our fire problem and they should be able to integrate solutions into their profession because until we do that, we're not gonna solve this problem. It's gonna be here. Um, and so I think we really all need to work together across all types of professions here in California. It shouldn't just stay with a fire ecologist at a university. Everyone needs to be working with these issues across California. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and I know um, with all that you've shared just now that there were bound to be questions in people's heads. So my suggestion is knowing that we need to keep moving a little bit, maybe we could take two questions quickly now. And then um, Kate, is there a way that people could follow up with you if they had further questions? Um, yeah, I guess one question I have for you all, I don't know if you all have a lunch break, maybe I could call back on because it might be easier for me to answer questions in Zoom than in email. Okay, so um, we don't take a lunch break. We're finishing up at 12, but we will have a little bit more time for questions at the very end. So if you wouldn't mind logging on again at sort of 11.45, that would okay. be great. Um, in that case, let's save it till then, if that's okay with folks here. Um, I know uh, you, you share so much richness that um, it brings up a huge conversation to be had. Um, and we're going to move on with some of our fire physics lessons at this point. Um, thank you so much though, Kate. We really appreciate you being here and we'll see you back about 11, 11.30, 11.45. Okay, that sounds okay. great. See you then. Okay. So, um, Okay, if you're just going to finish sharing, that would be great. Yes, I'm trying to navigate. <laughs> Don't worry, I know how that goes. <laughs> great, thank you so much. So um, I'm going to shift gears very slightly. Um, I'm sure something that might be on all of your minds right now is with all that Kate has just shared with us, how on earth do we have the confidence to be working with fire and students, right? <laughs> How do we couple these two things? So um, before Ali gets into some of the practical demonstration of the lessons, I just want to run through quickly some of the safety rules that we have in place um, and the ways that we manage to um, work with the students and feel really confident about it. Um, hoping everybody can see my screen. Somebody wants to give me a thumbs up just to, great. I see Stephen, thank you so much. Okay. So first of all, um, really crucial to know your audience, right? And I know that that's different depending on where you are. If you are um, working with these students regularly, if it's your classroom, you have a good sense of who's in the class with you. If you're doing a field visit with a school, make sure you check in with the teacher in advance. Make sure they know what you're expecting of the students um, and then discuss with them ways that you might be able to handle if there were some students that might be um, particularly affected by this topic. Um, and then also make sure that you recognize that different ages are going to have um, different capacities to be able to do some of these hands-on practical lessons. Of course, we're focusing on middle school now, but there are lessons from um, early elementary all the way through high school. So look at the age group that you're working with and assess um, how they're going to be able to work with these this, this models. Um, one thing I found that works really well is you give the students the information they need to be safe, and we will talk about that in just a minute, and then they become the safety officers. And I can't tell you how many times students have told me, hey, you need to put your safety glasses on as I'm just about to light a model, or you know, you need to get your hair back. And it's because they've got the information, and often I'll say to them, who's gonna be my safety officer? And frequently, I need that check, we all do. So um, that really gives them that capacity of like, oh yeah, I am part of, I am responsible in doing this. And I think that's the other part that I've really seen as well is that we start with lessons where we're just talking about burning one match and we're doing that very gradually and we're thinking about safety there too. Only when we've seen that students can operate with one match safely, would we even think about then transferring that to a model like Ali will show us in a minute with, with more matches and more capacity for risk. So um, you're gonna be gaining that and you can share that with the students that you're gonna be looking out for how they have um, been acting responsibly, how safe they've been. And if you see that safety model, then you're gonna be able to show them these other cool lessons. Otherwise, you'll just be demonstrating. Okay, so any ideas, if you guys wouldn't mind taking yourselves off mute, that would be great. Um, any ideas on how we would stay safe if we were doing, for example, a model a bit like this? Um, what would be some of the key safety features? And you might see some in this picture. 
Uh, fire extinguisher. Yeah, absolutely. Fire extinguisher, really crucial. Um, make sure it's right next to you. One thing I've also learned with students is this is a great time to check in whether they know how to use a fire extinguisher. And right. frequently, 80% or so don't. And they just need to get the chance to see where that little key is that you have to pull out and then understand that you'd be directing it toward the fire and you'd make sure the nozzle's there. So this is a great opportunity to just show them, um, guide them through that. Anything else? Well, water, some water source. Yeah, so I normally keep um, a bucket of water nearby um, or if it's just a really small model, just a little, you know, um, a pan of water, um, that's really helpful. We also have spray bottles, Ali will show us in a minute, so that can help really keep things under control. Anything else? Well, seeing this outside makes me think that I just want to have a, a hose with a nozzle that I can just turn on. Yeah, that also is great and it, really importantly, your location really affects the things that you're going to be bringing right. in. Today. Yeah, so um, this is outside on our patio where I work. Really good point. Um, I can get a hose there dead easy and that would be really helpful. Anything else? Natural <laughs> fiber clothing or something that won't, um, or like what's, whatever that fire clothing is called. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. So this lady's actually wearing a Nomex lab coat. We don't all have those, but it is worth checking in with the students before your field trip or your sessions to ask them to wear if, they're, if possible. And I am aware that this isn't possible for everybody because most of what we buy these days is very heavily synthetic. Um, but if they can, like not real shiny soccer shorts, those kinds of things, if they can have things like that, and also their shoes, closed toed shoes are quite important too. Um, anything else? Defensible space. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, here we are near a wooden building, but part of the reason for that is that just on the other side of that is all of our wildland area. Um, so we're trying to look at how much area do we have that's really safe around us. Um, anything else? Well, it occurs to me if you're going to be outside, you got to really think about the weather. <laughs> you know, if, if you're going to have a windstorm coming up, be a bad idea. You got it. So, and that um, it's worth just bearing in mind that I can change. <laughs> so you might think in the morning when you set up your experiment, we're all good. And then in the period when you're just introducing the lesson to the class, you're going to change that. And it's great to have the class involved in that decision so they can feel why we came to that decision. If there are winds that start coming up, and you feel this isn't safe anymore, maybe you're gonna change it so it's a demonstration done by you, or maybe you're gonna bring the class into that decision. Um, okay, I think we've got most of them, but I'm just gonna check. So here is the official firework safety list of how you're gonna be safe with your um, uh, class of students. Um, cotton clothing, no th synthetic pants, um, soccer shorts, etc. closed toed shoes, tie back loose sleeves, and tie back loose hair and it's super useful. I always have, even though I don't need it, my hair's too short, but I always have a few hair bands with me um, so that when uh, I am working with students, I can help um, share those around so that those with long hair can um, still get involved. Uh, make sure our fire extinguisher is close, make sure it's charged and know how to use it. Make sure spray bottles are close and filled with water. Wear safety goggles. So as I say, most often the students remind me on that one. That's the one I'm most likely to forget setting up. Glasses or safety goggles, that just helps make sure that your eyes that are very sensitive are really well protected. Never, this is a really hard one, <laughs> never lean over a fire. And it's another one that students have caught me out on because in the moment, it's so easy, right? Just to be leaning over to get to the um, part of the model that you want to show them. So never lean over a fire, that's a really risky thing, especially when you've got like flappy clothing that could easily just catch. Um, always make sure that your burned materials are fully extinguished with water before putting them in the trash. So um, often that's how fires can be started in trash cans because somebody put something in that was not fully extinguished. So students really need to be aware that um, if there is any smoke or heat coming from the fuel, it could still be an ignition source. It could still start a fire. So not just when you see flames. And then of course, if a fire starts on you, stop drop and roll. And last but certainly not least, very important to share with students that whilst we're modeling these things in the class in a safe setting today, this is not something that you will go home and do by yourself as a practice. They're great and exciting lessons, but you must never do them unless you have consent, consent to do it 
from an adult and to do it with an adult. Um, so that's really important to uh, stress. I've never had a time when that has been the case, but I think it's a, um, a concern and a, a valid one that we just want to make sure we share that. So, Hannah, I have a question about make, know how to use the fire extinguisher. My experience is showing some a child, especially how to use a fire extinguisher, doesn't mean anything until they try to use it the first time. Go, oh my God, and it goes flying into the air because they just don't. That's, you know, that's true. So and how I, far do we go? You know. So, I think if you can, um, th that's a whole other lesson, I would say. It's hard to fit it into one of these lessons because it's going to take time. But if you can work with your local fire department, that's the kind of thing that they can specialize in and they maybe would come out and um, practice with you. Um, and that would be a great way for the students to learn or to be working with a classroom. So I think that's a really good point though, Henry. It's just that kind of thing, right? You need to have had the kind of muscle memory of how it felt the first time you did it safely before you could feel really confident in doing it and when you were nervous and stressed. And so, just a thought, yeah. all districts in California, are, their teachers are supposed to be trained in that. Um, not that they all are, but that they're supposed to. So you can always kind of give that to the adult in the room. Great. If, yeah. You know, anyway, just a that's, thought. That's really useful um, feedback. Thanks, Tricia. So um, I, I know we need to keep moving fairly quickly. So I have three layouts now for the model that um, Ali's about to show us, the burn boards. You don't need to understand it fully right now, but the sense is that they are modeling a forest. I think you watched some videos of this as well. But I have these three trays laid out in slightly different ways to work with different age groups. Um, does anybody want to give me, so this is a kind of spot the difference. <laughs> does anybody want to give me um, one thing that you see that's different between these three models? Hmm. One of them doesn't have matches. That's right, very important. So one doesn't have matches at all. The students could still- And that's the one for the middle school boys, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I have to say exactly. that's why I've been learning. <laughs> third, third, third graders <laughs> also, right. third grade yeah. boys too. The, uh, I think, I the think middle it, one doesn't have a uh, strike pad. Exactly, perfect. Right. So they could still be moving the matches around, but they don't have the capacity to actually be able to start that. That's still something that we're gonna come and help with. Um, the first one, you know, it's important to recognize they still could move those matches around. There's still quite a lot they can do, um, but they're not going to be able to strike any matches. Um, and let's see, the third model as well. Um, so the third model, they have everything. Um, they also even have these little cotton wool balls which they could use as extra fuel. And Ali will probably be showing us that in a minute. So there are different ways that you can um, switch up the experiment that we're about to see um, to make sure that you feel safe. And that goes for pretty much all of these um, fire physics experiments. Okay. So we've already really touched on this, but very quickly, do take into consideration your location. This is my work. <laughs> it's great fire country. We had a large fire here in 2018 that um, burned about two thirds of the site. So I know how it feels to have a fire on your doorstep. Um, and so I'm very cautious about how we um, do these um, uh, experiments here. So I don't do fire science lessons here outside of, um, I, I only do them outside of fire season, which of course is a smaller and smaller period now as time goes by. Um, that doesn't have to be the case for everybody, I think. It depends on your situation, but for me, I know that's the right thing for our site. Um, make sure the experiment area is clear and far from grasses and any other flammable areas. Um, concrete's really best. That's what I feel most comfortable with and a big area around me. Um, watch out for lofting. So lofting is just, you know, when you're burning something and sometimes at the campfire, you see those little embers going up into the sky. So if you're on a day when there is enough wind for that to start happening, that's probably a day you want to consider whether it's really safe to be conducting your um, experiment. Um, and then also engage the students in making that safety decision. And as I say, that safety decision might change during the course of your experiment, you might suddenly feel like actually the weather is changing and I'm gonna check in with the students and say, hey, do you guys think this is still safe? What changed? How's that gonna affect how fire behaves? Um, okay, I think um, we are there and I am gonna stop sharing now. And I'm gonna cast over to Ali. Ali, are you ready for us? Yeah, so the first thing that we're going to go through is the matchstick burn boards. And we use this 
lesson as a bit of a sandwich lesson. Um, we use it both at the beginning as kind of an engage to get really, kids really excited. And then we also use it again at the end of the lesson series. Um, so the first, le the first time you do it, it's just a teacher demonstration. The idea is to get students um, just familiar with the idea that they're gonna be working with fire and to show them, like plant the idea of some experiments that they could be um, designing. And then also just to get them really excited about the unit. Um, the second lesson, it's used at the end of the lesson series to really test what students have learned about the fire triangle, test their ability to create and test hypotheses. Um, so this one is when students can really have free reign to be like, you know what, I want to see how this impacts fire behavior. I want to see how this impacts fire behavior. Um, so you could really arrange the matchstick burn boards in any way. You can also um, use Play-Doh and a pie tin, and then you can mess with the arrangement of the fuels even more, or sand in a, some kind of wet sand in a pie tin also. So that way you can get them closer together than with the burn boards. Students can measure things like flame height or severity of the fire, so how many matches burn. They can measure the rate of spread. So the, the time that it took to burn everything divided by the number of matches consumed. They can matter, um, measure total consumption and also intensity of the fire by seeing how close they have to get their hand to feel the heat of the fire, not to burn themselves, but just until they first start to feel that heat. So you all probably know the three things that fire needs to burn oxygen, heat, and fuel. Um, what do you think are the three things that determine how fires behave? Weather, slope, and there's another part there. Yes, yeah, so weather, topography, and fuel, again. So how those things are arranged and how they interact determine how a fire behaves. So we're just going to go through a few um, matchstick burn boards that I have set up. And so I'm gonna put on my safety glasses. I have a cotton shirt on. I'm actually just in my front yard, which uh, is the road, which um, does have some debris on it. So I sprayed everything with water. And so this is a really great way to see how you could do the lessons virtually. Um, if you wanted the students to still be able to make their own hypotheses, you could send them a diagram of the matchstick burn board and they can label what goes in every hole. So there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of do this lesson, even if you're doing virtual learning, distance learning. Um, and so I'll just kind of go through those with you now. So, um. I like to start with just, you all can still hear me, right? Yeah, we can hear you good, Great. thanks, Ellie. Um, so I, even though um, you all have seen this basic, this is just the basic uh, w one match in every peg. Um, weather is something I can't control. If you're doing this in the classroom, a science classroom under a hood, then you're controlling the weather, but I like to just see how this is going to burn before I decide how I do everything else. So we can already tell it's a little windy because one of our, our first match went out. So we know the wind is going to impact our fire behavior today. And I might try and... So, Ali, you're lighting every match along the edge there, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. We're attempting to. <laughs> I 
it doesn't look like it's so easy. And my neighbors just stole my um, kitchen uh, lighter, the like long one. So those make it easier, but I don't have mine right now. So we can see how this is behaving. Can everyone see how the flames are blowing this way? So what does that tell us about how the weather is impacting this fire spread? So if the flames are bending, what's probably happening from this direction? So Mark and the wind, chat. That would be a, go ahead. That Trish. would be a wind, wind driven fire in the direction the flames were bending. Exactly. So um, based on that, I can tell that the wind is kind of sometimes gusting pretty high today. So I'm not going to use cotton balls. Cotton balls are something that create a lot of lofting. They do make a very dramatic fire and they do um, really imitate, uh, you know, like blackberry or grapevines. You can really imitate what that fuel behavior is like with cotton balls. But cotton balls are something that I would use more during the winter um, and definitely not right next to my house in the middle of a neighborhood. Um, so I have a few right, doing more. Doing someone else's neighborhood instead, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I have a few more burn boards and so I have this one. Um, can you all kind of see how it starts low and gets higher? What do you think I was trying to recreate with this burn board? Uh, understory and a canopy for? Yeah, so the idea of ladder fuels. So I have a perfect ladder that goes from here to here. In addition to having this flat, I can also put it on a slope using the nail. Which would you all rather see? Would you flat. rather see flat? Okay. Um, I'd rather see flat first. So before we burn this one, I'm curious if anyone has a hypothesis for what might happen. And you can just feel free to Unmute yourself and, and make a an educated guess. Well, are you having a lightning strike in fact, or are you lighting the bottom? What are you going to do? I'm going to light along this edge right here. Okay. Yeah, well, the way the wind was going, I imagine it's all going to go up. Yeah. Okay. So That's so my theory think... too. With the with the wind, it'll it'll move up into the canopy. I yeah. agree. I agree. Cool. So let's let's test it out. I see Mark's added in the chat there, crown fire. He thinks it's going to be a crown fire. There goes the old growth forest. Aww. <laughs> uh, it could be a pine farm. We don't know. Oh, there you go. So as I'm doing this, I can use a, a ruler to measure flame length. Um, this is easier, obviously, when you have a group of students working together to measure flame length. I can also do this, what I was talking to you all about before with heat. I'm seeing how close my hand has to get to feel the heat. So what was something you all observed? Something kind of interesting happened there that maybe is a little bit different or maybe similar to what would happen in a real forest fire. Um, so if these were trees that were a bit thicker, we can see this match, it just burned in the middle.
but it didn't reach the top. So we didn't yeah, have quite en a good enough ladder. And we can hypothesize that perhaps if this was a forest fire, um, maybe it wouldn't have reached the crown of all the trees. Or maybe the trees wouldn't have fallen over before they burned because they wouldn't be mastics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'll just do a couple more. And that one especially made me really happy that I had um, doused the ground with fire because we did have one that lit one that fell over. So this one, we can see there's a fuel break. So what do you think? Do you hypothesize that this fuel break might be large enough? Current winds, probably not. Okay. I'll, I'll say it might be large enough. I'd go that far. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I agree with Stephen with the wind that you have, even though it's mild. I think it's going to, it's not going to be big enough. I was going to say it might take a little bit longer to ignite this sort of second set of matches on the other side, depending on the wind. And. So would this be a day that you would cancel because of this wind? I, I think um, go on, I would still do it. Okay. Yeah, I would just be careful about the fire size. Um, it's still really interesting to see how the wind interacts with the fire. And I will say that using the, the lighter is a bit safer. So this is a day that you would be demonstrating and not having the kids do it as well. Um, I've done it on windy days like this with students. How old were they? Out of curiosity. We were in middle school. Okay. And I think it depends a lot on what um, situation you have because you know if you have a nice safe area, then um, you can feel far more confident. If you um, right. are struggling to have spaces without um, grasses yeah. nearby, that's a challenge. All right, go fire break. So yeah, so that one, we had a total weather impact, right? The wind kind of stopped and the fire break then worked. Um, so just a few more ideas. And I'm just gonna speed through because um, Kate went a little bit longer. But just so you know, you can always cut any of the matches to different sizes. You can play around with spacing. Um, when I've done the lesson before, I've even had students, um, you know, at the Hoplin Rec, I was like, okay, so if we're looking at the landscape, the hillside over there looks different than the hillside over there. Should we build models of the two different hillsides to see how they would behave? You can do a fire, a backing fire, so lighting from the top to see how that behaves as opposed from, from the bottom. Um, the matches can represent either trees or shrubs, or they can even represent continuous or bunch grasses. So really you can be as creative um, or um, restricted as possible with this lesson. Uh, most kids are really interested and curious once they start it, and they want to do a ton of experiments. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely one to like save a bunch of time to do. And like I said, when the students are doing it, it's at the end of the series. So they've already worked with fire. You already know what to expect, and you already can gauge how comfortable you are with them um, doing these experiments. Uh, are there any other questions on this lesson before I hand it back over to Hannah? Yes, Allie, will you tell me what the boards are made of? Yeah, so they're just um, particle board. Um, so just like um, a bunch of wood chips glued together. So they, so they could also burn. They're not uh, the fireproof or anything. Um, I have seen them get really hot and they've never burned before. They do get a little bit scorched. Um, 
but we saw Ali is on it, you know, and I think that's really like an instruction the students, as soon as you feel like things, the fire's moving right down and it's moving toward that board, then you can be there with the spray bottle. Right. Yeah. So one other challenge to think about is um, like this one, I let burn a little bit longer and that's going to equal maybe 10 minutes of work for me to get all these little nubs out of the holes. Um, so definitely have your students clean out the burn boards um, because it is a, a quite right. time intensive right. job. Right. Um, but yeah, they're, they're pretty good. So in the curriculum kits, we also include miniature fans. So if you happen to have a really calm day and you want to see wind, then you can use the fan. You have to use it from a little bit away to not blow out. So you can add wind experimentally. You can also add humidity experimentally by lightly misting the board ahead of time. Really um, working with students to remind them that this is more than just fun playing with fire, that we're thinking of hypotheses and testing those hypotheses. It's easy for this lesson to fall into fun playing with fire. And I like to still do just one burn board if it's a good day for it with a lot of cotton balls and all the matches and just see like what happens, you know, just because they're curious. Um, but definitely, you know, concentrating on that, like we're going to develop a hypothesis. We're going to think about how we would arrange our matchstick to test it and then um, test it. Stephanie, did you have a question? Yes, when you do use the cotton balls, like, can you show, like, where do you place them? How do you actually put them on the board? Yeah, so. Okay, Ali, so, it's hard to hear you when you go, okay, great, we're good now. Yeah, so, so there's a few different ways you could use them. I could use them like a ball like this and just stick it right there, and that's a lot like um, and that would be a lot like a, a bush. I can also unroll the cotton ball. Like this and do like a this type of thing. Like that. And that would remind me more of like a, a grapevine or a blackberry vine or even, um, a poison oak vine. Mm -hmm. So thinking about how vines could be um, spreaders of fire up, up a tree. Yeah, so it's really, um, you can use them in different creative ways. And I've had students get even more creative with them. You can tear them apart, but yeah, they do create that lofting. So either doing it first thing in the morning when the humidity is high and the temperatures are low or during the winter, right after a rain event, or in a huge parking lot. Mm. And when I do this with a big group, I have students whose main job is to follow anything, like follow with their eyes, any little lofting pieces so that they could see if that caught anywhere. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth um, noting as well, Ali, that we're looking at um, examples of when it burns really easily. Um, I think you and I have both had times when we've done it in the morning and it's damp enough that the matches just will not light at all. So um, yeah. you can have the opposite problem where you just don't get anything happening. Um, yeah. So it's worth checking on any given day, just you know how things are. And some, some mornings you just can't do it too early in the day. It's, That's a, it's a great lesson on why it's good to mow really in the morning or you get something out of it, you know. Yeah. Park's yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, cool. So I'll hand it back over to Hannah and she's going to go over the fire triangle lessons as I um, move some things back in my house. <laughs> no worries. Thanks so much, Ali. So often um, I know when we do these lessons, what we'll start with is um, having a burn board demonstration like Ali's just shown us with um, the teacher or the educator working with the students. So they get to see the burn board. They kind of get excited. Um, it's also a great time when they get excited about the burn boards 
to go back to your list of um, agreed kind of community care elements of like how we, okay, we're really excited about this fire now. How is that changing our language? And how are we gonna make sure that we continue to check in and make sure we're being um, just cautious about the, how, how excited and how we express that if that makes other people feel worried. Um, I think it's an interesting balance to strike between those two things. Um, so then um, once you've kind of got them hooked with the um, fire burn board that we've just seen a demonstration, then you would go back to the fire triangle lessons that I'm going to go over, which takes it right back to just one match to get us all feeling confident with just that stage. So bear with me a minute. I'm going to get our screen shared here. Okay, can somebody give me a thumbs up? Let me know you see it. Super, thank you so much, you guys. So um, we are gonna be uh, swiftly moving through, there are really three lessons. They could be packed into one lesson by making it into stations and students going around. Um, if uh, you were doing this um, virtually, then obviously you'd have to do them in, um, you'd have to do them as demonstrations. Um, and I would say that it's very easy as well. There's so much to talk about with each of these that they could be three independent lessons of 40, 45 minutes um, to be doing. And they're gonna be in the increasing the student's understanding of the fire triangle through experimentally removing just, in, just different parts, those three sides that we talked about. Let's play with each part of it experimentally and understand how that affects the whole triangle. Without one of those sides, the whole triangle falls down. So the first lesson is the heat plume, and that's looking at how heat moves. So again, we are focusing on our fire triangle. You guys have heard me say it enough times and the students kind of, you know, they get to the point where they're like, all right, we know all the fire triangle, <laughs> you've said it. We've said it six million times. So um, heat, fuel, and the last one is oxygen. But for this experiment, we are mostly playing with heat or experimenting with heat. Fuel does come into it, but the thing we're really considering is heat. And so when we're thinking about heat, what's really important is for us to understand how does heat move? How does it um, get from one place to another? How is it transferred? And of course, there are three main ways in which that's happening. Conduction. Anybody want to tell me another one? Convection. Convection and oh, and there's the third one, radiation. Radiation. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. <laughs> um, so these three things you can actually model with the students before you do the experiment. But there is a crucial element that really helps you to model it, which is often the case, and that's candy. So if you can get a bag of candy in advance or something that you feel comfortable sharing with the students, um, then you can get the students to line up and um, when they're standing in a line to model conduction. Um, you're going to give a, an amount of the candy, some of the candy, a bag maybe, of the candy to the beginning of the line. So that heat is at the beginning of that object and it's going to move along the line. So that student is going to pass down the bag of candy down through the line and we're seeing how that candy, the heat, is moving from one student to another by direct contact. Um, for radiation, you are going to keep them in their line and you can sprinkle the candy out, throw carefully to the students a few pieces of candy and of course that's um, the heat moving as particles or waves and so it's only going to transfer its heat once it hits something. Um, so that's how they're getting the candy. And then the last one is convection which is a little more complicated when you're doing with a group of students like this. You need for them then to imagine that the students at one end of the line are at the bottom closer to the ground and the students at the other end of the line are at the top, further away from the ground. And they're thinking about how the atmosphere is a little denser when it's closer, the Earth's gravity is pulling it more tightly to, the, to Earth. And then as you go up, it's a little um, less dense. So um, the heat, once things get hot, they um, start, have enough energy to start moving up and less pressure in that thinner atmosphere as they move up. So you can give the remaining candy, which is probably not much at this point, to um, a couple of students at one end of the line and they can move up the line. And as they're moving up, 
they're going to give candy until they've run out and then that's it all their heat is dissipated they can go no further up into the ice. i just have something i want to say yeah. about candy having had students before that are diabetic and having done math experiments where we suck on lollipops and measure the circumference yes. you really don't want to use candy with sugar you want to use sugarless candy because that's a real issue for a lot of kids who may not even know they're diabetic or the teacher may not know. And so you don't want, you just don't want to expose kids to that. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that's really important. And again, yeah. you know, often you'll know your students and you'll know if candy is the right thing to use. Hey, right. Well, you can use candy, but I just found that I had to use sugarless candy or I was looking for big trouble. Super. Thank you so much for sharing that, Gay. That's really important. Yeah. Okay, so once you've gone through um, that process with the students, then you're actually going to be um, thinking with them about what things um, can create a fire. So where are the sources of heat that sometimes could start a fire? And I'm not just talking about wildland fire here, any kind of fire. So do you guys, if you can, use the annotate function. So remember last time we tried doing this, normally if you move your cursor up to the top of your screen maybe, you'll see a little thing that flips up and says that you can annotate. You can write into this space here any sources of heat that you know. If you prefer, I'll have a look in the chat and I'll see them there as well. So any things that would be ignition or sources of heat that could start a fire, not just wildland fire. Excellent. Great, thanks you guys. Those are excellent ones. And yeah, it's always exciting to see what students come up with as well. They often come up with all kinds of things. So we have um, a magnifying glass in the sun, right? You're really bringing in the sun's energy um, and uh, students very regularly come up with that one. Um, a spark from a mower, so if there's some electrical equipment that creates a spark. Um, the sun, again, that's often, the, again, the students normally come up with that lightning. Um, I see things that burn here as well that we are adding in. Um, matches, now that's a kind of chemical reaction when we're sparking that. Um, excellent stove that might run on gas and you have that sparker that gets that running. So um, now's a great time to think about, okay, so here's some examples of ways that a fire can start, the heat that starts a fire. Are any of these things that occur naturally? So would occur without humans involved? Can anybody see one on there that maybe is something that- uh, Lightning, lightning is on there. Exactly, you got it, that's right. So we have lightning in there. There's one other thing that occurs in nature that could happen without humans involved and could create um, heat to create a fire. Any ideas? Like the magnified sunlight or like a reflection of the sunlight? So that's that's true. I mean, normally we've got something that we're doing that allows so a human's involved there somewhere, but it might happen uh, without that. Yeah. You can get spontaneous combustion on, say, stack leaves and needles that have the right moisture content within them and mm -hmm. that produces you know, heat. We, we don't want to forget a volcano, too, in Lake County. I guess we could have an eruption. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, no, that's, a, that, that's the, the other thing I was looking for. I think the other elements are true as well. But volcanoes, right? We have right. a natural process, might not be something that we think about too much, but it is natural. So there are all these ways that um, there is heat um, that sometimes is created by humans, as Kate was talking about, and sometimes it's natural in the environment. So before we get doing anything, we've already gone through this. Oh, let me just get my annotation off here so you guys can see a little bit better. Okay, um, I don't need to go through all of these again, but uh, just worth checking in at this stage with your students, making sure that they remember. Often what I'll do is just check in with them and see if they can remember all of them with me before I put this up again. Okay, let me just navigate all these different functions. Okay. So once you're feeling safe and um, 
normally I'll designate at least a few students to be my safety officers. Frequently, the students I pick as my safety officers are the ones that have shown the greatest level of excitement about burning things. Just giving you a head. What we do with them, so we're taking this very tentatively, right, is how to safely light one match. That's something that you're going to show to them. And this is still something that you're deciding maybe, is this a demonstration or are they actually going to be able to do this for themselves? Um, and I'm, I've actually frequently been surprised about how hard that is for students, lighting a match. It's something that um, they, they haven't done and if they do know how to do it, they don't do it safely. So you wanna make sure that you're doing it over something which is non-flammable. We are always using a kind of metal cookie sheet for all of these experiments um, as our non-flammable surface directly below. Then if you did get hot fingers at any point, you can drop your match and it's fine. Um, you want to be doing it away from you and you want to make sure that you're not holding it so that you're going to get a hot hand as it, as it starts to light. So you want to be kind of level, just maybe tilted down slightly, that helps to get it going, but you don't want to have it um, so that it's going to be um, going straight up heat into your hand. And I normally have just a little kind of bath of water right next to me as well. So I've got my tray to be safe, but then I've got something that just makes me feel extra safe there too. So for this first experiment, because of our time today, I don't think I'm going to be able to model all of these for us, but I suspect you guys um, know the, the system. So the first experiment, um, this is the setup for it. And our question is, where does the heat go? So the students have a student worksheet to work through this. They are going to be using all of their safety skills that they've been learning. And um, again, this could be a demonstration or student led. They are going to light this match and you are going to have a student whose job it is to hold their hand just to the point away from the matches once it's lit where they can just start to feel the heat um, and they're going to do that in four different places underneath on either side and at the top and they need to know that you're not trying to show how tough you are this isn't about how close you can get and how much heat you can feel. It's about just starting to sense, oh yeah, I just sense the change in temperature here. And you're going to have another student who is measuring where that is. And that student wants to be careful as they're doing it because they're measuring kind of from the burning area up to the other student's hand. So just being thoughtful and conscious of that too. And once they've um, recorded four measurements, they may have to burn multiple matches to get these measurements. They don't have to rush it. They can do it nice and calmly and slowly. Um, then they should have measurements for those four areas. Now you can ask them beforehand to do a hypothesis of what the heat around, so this is the center of your um, match. This is, we're imagining where, where we lit it. Um, and then this is the heat that we feel around it. So they can, if they wish to do a hypothesis and put how they think the heat's going to be distributed around where we light the match. And then they can add into this afterwards when they've got their measurements, they can actually add that in. Um, does anybody want to um, use their annotate right now and show me what they think the heat plume will look like? Kind of the shape of the heat around that um, centrally burned match. No pressure. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So you guys, you guys got it. Um, what we're seeing mostly is that the, uh, the heat's rising from that convection that we talked about. Um, you do have all forms of um, transfer of heat though, just in this model. And you can talk further with the students about when the heat is radiant energy. And there is one time when they might recognize um, conduction as well. Does anybody want to tell me, maybe I'm gonna go back a slide. Uh, when do you think the students might um, realize that the conduction is also a problem for them? Yeah, push the alligator clip. You got it. So once they've mm. completed their experiment, this is, and it's really hot. So that's really important. That's where your um, oven mitt comes into play. They need to know that in advance though. They will learn con conduction very quickly if they try to cl clip that clip when the match is just burned on it. Um, okay. So let me just go back and get my annotation off. 
Sometimes I think these bars move around just to uh, confuse me. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll move on to the next lesson now. Anybody have any questions on that one? Great. Um, so the next lesson, we are looking at heat and fuel a little bit, but mostly fuel on the fire triangle here. So focus, as I said, we're going through three lessons focusing on different parts of the triangle. So anybody want to give me some suggestions? You could just call them out since we're moving fairly swiftly. What kinds of things would act as fuel? And again, don't think just of wildland, you could think of any kind of fire. Leaves. What was that, leaves? Sticks. Sticks. Propane, natural gas. Mm -hmm. Houses. Yeah. Curtains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and I, you know, I think we're, we're moving quickly, so I'm not going to give too much more time for this, but this is a time when um, sometimes it is a little sensitive, I think, some of the things that get brought up. I mean, bringing up houses, completely appropriate, it's reality, but that's a time when you're going to be want to make check back in on your ground rules. It's appropriate to bring it up, but it's also a time that we might be feeling anxiety. So talking about those fuels I've learned can be a sensitive area. I've had students bring things up that I felt like this is a little too much for the conversation we're having right now. Um, like someone says people yes exactly right, right. Mm -hmm. and then a big discussion about how flammable people are i mean i've had that i've had that happen oh, and uh it, this is middle school and we want to be really cognizant so that that made me think okay i missed a step when we went through our ground rules and i missed reconnecting to ground rules when we got to this point because if i'd had a closer connection to it then i would have been able to turn back and say do you know we talked about this and we're going to stick with our ground rules and i don't know if you guys as experienced teachers have any other suggestions of ways of handling that Feel free to chip in at any time because I'm very aware that you guys have a lot of experience and I'm happy to happy to hear from it. Um, I tend to, oh, yeah. go ahead. I just would say that I tend to acknowledge and, and kind of like move on from that. Like I, I know that what you said is, is true, that is true, but like that's also a sensitive topic. Like let's move on from that. Excellent. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks for that. Right. That's exactly right, Meredith. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate that. Um, Okay, so um, when we're looking at this lesson, we get a little bit more into the chemical equation associated with fire. We are talking about a chemical equation. The students can think about how a chemical equation is different from other changes of state, um, from exa for example, a change of state. Um, so you couldn't easily uh, change things back to what they were before. Um, so the students will be introduced to this equation. And at the end of this, they're going to link up the fire triangle and this equation, because every fuel, it, its component parts will include carbon and hydrogen to different, different extents. And I've learned with middle schoolers that they're still, in many cases, they're still kind of just getting to contact with different elements in the periodic table. So that's something you'll understand about the students you're working with, but frequently they can come up with the fact that most fuels have these two elements in them, carbon and hydrogen. So here's the setup for this experiment. Um, same as the last one, really, but you've got one match pointing down and one match pointing up. Um, and they are going to be um, asking the question, why does the match go out? And um, so can you guys imagine which one of these burns, one for the longer time um, and uh, two, so let's see, which one would burn with more heat and which one would burn for the longer time? Anybody want to suggest? I would think the one pointing down would burn with more heat. Mm -hmm. And the one, uh, on the right one pointing up would probably burn longer. Yeah, exactly. And that's normally what we find. Um, and and want, want to give me any suggestions of why you think that might be the case? Because of my experiential knowledge where I burn my fingers. <laughs> in the past that's my yeah. that's why i know this yeah yeah which is very important right and the right. students will have had well they may well have had that kind of situation too you've got a couple of things they have just been learning about convection and how heat rises so they've right. seen that and then they've also seen that the fuel 
that fire is continually coming into contact with the fuel. So it's rising and it's going up the fuel. So we're sticking with our fire triangle here. With this one, yes, you've got your heat rising, but it's no longer interacting with the fuel. Mm -hmm. However, you may well find that this one burns longer um, because it's gradually moving down. And again, you know, that depends on a lot of elements of the You mean longer in time, not longer, longer. in distance. Mm -hmm. Exactly, longer in right. time. So they can be measuring the height of the flame rather than the heat maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they can be measuring the time. And again, there's a student worksheet that goes with that that illustrates the, um, the way that the experiment is set up. Okay. Hannah, I'm sorry just to jump in. Maybe just take like two minutes for the last lesson. Um, just because we're at 11.45. Thank you, Ali. I appreciate you keeping an eye on the time for me. Um, so I did just want to show you, this is some students I worked with doing this experiment not that long ago. Um, you know, students have all kinds of things. So using the fire triangle to explain why the match went out, well, Owen <laughs> blew on it. So, you know, that's kind of thing. <laughs> Excellent answer. <laughs> So uh, and then this, is, this is another student sheet where afterwards the students are asked to link up the three sides of the fire triangle and mm. just make sure that they link up with that chemical equation. And um, I think it's a great way for them just to relate back that fire triangle to what's going on. So the last experiment, um, we're going to be playing with the last part of the fire triangle oxygen that we haven't played with yet. Um, I'm sure, oops. I'm sure you guys have done something similar to this where um, you are uh, seeing if you deprive oxygen from a burning match or candle, what's going to happen. So in this situation, um, we have one candle which is burning in just normal air with the oxygen in there. Um, and you can explain to the students that air does have about 20%, I think it's 21% oxygen in it. Um, and then uh, in this plastic one, first of all, you'll show them that the candle burns in there anyway. And then you'll add some baking soda in the bottom, put the candle back in again, and then um, carefully sprinkle a little bit of vinegar just around the edges. Um, and then quite quickly, that reaction will take place, creating the gas carbon dioxide. And very quickly, you'll find um, that that um, candle goes out. What's also wow. fun, yeah, it's fun as well because the students are then like, no, I don't think that's what happened. You mm -hmm. accidentally got it wet with the vinegar. And then you can get your match and you can try and relight it. And it will not relight because the carbon dioxide sinks to the bottom. And so you've mm. got this kind of pool of carbon dioxide in the bottom and it just won't, it, you won't be able to light it. So it's a really fun um, experiment to do as well. And then they get to see all three sides of the fire triangle in experiments. All right, Ali, I'm going to stop screen sharing and hand back over to you. <laughs> That's a good experiment. I like that mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we're just going to power through the last couple of lessons. Um, these ones, obviously, uh, we're not going to um, demonstrate. One of them is the bonfire challenge. And the goal of this lesson is just to create an understanding of how the properties of fuel impact their flammability. So you'll break the students into different groups and they'll each get a different recipe and they'll be trying to make a small fire with that recipe. Um, and beforehand, they'll make hypotheses about which recipe burns the easiest or is the hardest to burn, which one is going to burn the longest or will just burn the shortest, and which one will burn the most completely or least completely. So you can see mm -hmm. the recipes here. And if you have a really large group or you're really interested in, in examining this more, you could even make more recipes, um, you know, just based on your goals for your students. Um, so here is an example. If we were doing in-person teacher training, this is what you all would look like doing the lessons. <laughs> um, so these are the four different recipes at work. And you can see one of the recipes was really successful. This is another lesson where you're concerned about lofting of small materials. So you're having someone do a lookout. You're worried about the, the space around you. Best place to do it are large parking lots. Um, or after a rain. Um, afterwards, there is a description for how to do a Socratic circle um, discussion with your students, thinking about um, 
fuel moistures, hypotheses, how the different recipes burn. Um, so there's a lot of add-ons in this lesson for how to have a really in-depth conversation about properties of different fuels. The next lesson, and you all saw this already, um, is the Tinker Tree Derby. And this is a lesson um, I would say that is the most um, risky in terms of fire danger. So you will be burning um, little pieces of newspaper. So this is the one that I've cut out the most in thinking about a day um, with students because it does have the most lofting, but it is really interesting um, you're looking at how tree morphology impacts how likely a ground fire is to become a crown fire. Mm -hmm. So all trees want to have as many branches as possible so they, they can photosynthesize as much as possible. But in California, having too many branches too close to the ground can have a negative impact um, because those branches can catch on fire. So in the beginning, you start with the discussion of lather fuels. So you show a picture. This photo is of lather fuels. Um, so you can see how there's continuous stuff to light on fire from the ground all the way to the treetops. Um, and so this is what the, the um, tinker trees look like. And these were made um, especially by some folks at the rec that I work at. So you can make kind of um, makeshift versions of these using chemistry stands, but these ones were made specifically with this in mind and they're included in the curriculum kits. And we'll send you off a list of places where curriculum kits are hosted because you can borrow them at any time um, as long as they're not in use for another thing. So you do two rounds of this um, Tinker Tree Derby. The first round, um, so what the goals are is to is for the students to have as much um, inches of branch covered in newspaper as possible while also still surviving a fire. Um, so you're thinking about that advantage of having more leaves versus the disadvantage of creating um, a, a fire. So the first round you just put one a uh, crinkled newspaper underneath your tree and then any trees who make it through the first round without complete scorching get to join the championship round and that's when you have that fuels build up. So you do a few different layers of newspaper underneath the tree and um, see who makes it through that round. And I've seen trees make it through both. Some really fun or like creative ways is if you um, really smush down the paper so that it's really fine around the um, wire rods. And the wire rods, you can give the students as many um, as they like, and they can add them and arrange them in whatever way. The wire rods are of different lengths, so they can offset them or make any creative tree designs just to better understand that process of how things catch fire. Um, at the end, there's a worksheet that they can work through um, that um, has them explain some of their observations and hypotheses, and then also makes it some hypotheses about how fire might behave differently in the two ecosystems that are pictured here. So these are both oak woodlands, but obviously they're managed very differently. So how do we think fire might behave in one area and not the other? Okay, so... Um, the phenomena in action, as we talked about on Tuesday, um, this is a part of both this lesson series and the last lesson series. And so this is really using all those things they've learned to make an impact in their community. Um, so there's a really great document from the National Fire Protection Agency that Kate had mentioned before. Um, that's all about community service project ideas that youth can get involved in. So um, I would say open it up first to um, your students' ideas for what they think a project could be. If they're having trouble thinking of ideas for a project, they could go um, look at this website uh, and I can send that in the chat in just a moment. Um, if I was to do my project here, these are some of the places I would partner with. 
Um, if I was to do it out in Lake County, County I might partner with um, you all, Gay and Henry, to think of a, a phenomena and action project. So again, it's that fuels removal project ideas, restoration work, or letters to the other, talking to your local town council. Um, so it's really as creative as you would like it to be, um, but focusing on getting the students to utilize their, the, their learning to, um, to bring, bring that out to the community. So um, I just, there's five minutes left and I don't wanna hold anyone. So in the last five minutes, we're gonna have time for any questions about any of these lessons, or if you have any more questions for Kate, I'm sure that um, the three of us are happy to stay after. Um, or if you have any more questions about creating a phenomena and action project, um, just wanna just give you all some time. I know we've given you a lot of information this two hours. <sighs> And thanks, Kate, for joining us again. So we're, we're, we're lucky to be able to have Kate join us again. So um, yeah, let's open it up for questions. But if anybody, and I don't think we'll, we'll make any announcement at 12, but we completely understand if you slip out at this point. Mm -hmm. um, how many of the kits, like the kits that you're talking about, are available? I know that they might be in use at any time, but like just how many? So then that way, if, for example, myself and Ukiah wanted to work with somebody in Hopland, like they were not occupying the same kit. Yeah, so we, um, through our grant, had funds for 11 kits, and they'll kind of be spaced around Northern California at different cooperative extension offices and at the rec. Um, so in total, there's 11. They might be, you know, a little bit further of a drive. Um, if you know, two people from um, the Hopland Rec area, you know, someone might have to, we might have to arrange like switching it. Um, and it looks like Mark, um, he says that he has a kit down in Mariposa and Fresno County. So um, the kit, just a note about the kits, they include all the fire physics materials. They include um, the natural items for the mystery trees. They also will hopefully um, include most of the natural items for doing the Sierra Nevada version of the mystery trees. And we'll have most of the materials needed to do any lessons that the Sierra Nevada has that our Oak Woodlands doesn't have. So the kits are really um, all encompassing. They're two pretty huge trunks, um, but still of a size that could fit in the normal sedan. So where are the worksheets themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all the worksheets um, are in those curriculum, um, the links that I sent you to the box oh, drive. Great, okay. great. Yeah, and so just a note about those, all of that is still in the draft. We're still getting the final touches of everything together. Once it's all put together, and I'll just put this website in there now. Um, the curriculum will be hosted on the same website as the rest of the fireworks curricula. Um, and that is a, fr it's the frames website for the, um, oops, for fireworks. So I put that in the chat and I can email that to you all, but that's where the ultimate landing page will be. And that will have all of the lessons, all of student worksheets, links okay. to other helpful places, um, especially with um, the changes in teaching that are happening right now. Mm -hmm. We're going to create some links to um, different videos. Hannah and I are hopefully gonna make videos of most of the fire physics lessons. So, um, if you don't feel like you have the capacity to do them in your front yard, like we just did, then you could just have your students watch YouTube videos of, of sets of the experiments. Um, so that will kind of be that main landing page. Yeah, another question I have is that when I looked at a lot of the videos, they seem to show a lot of pine trees. And I have to say, we're talking about oak woodlands. So do you have videos or will you have them more about oak woodlands and or chaparral? 
because that's what we have in Lake County is chaparral and oak woodlands, not so much pines. Um, which videos uh, are you? Well, I, I, I saw the ones about fire the um, the the first day and the 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 one I saw before I saw the actual showing the fire. To there was like a hour and 37 minute and you said watch the first 37 minutes of it and again I wasn't seeing a lot of oak woodlands so yeah. I'm wondering <clears throat> what, do, what do you have that's oak woodlands and or chaparral because that's what we have here and that's what our kids are going to relate to more. Yeah so those videos that I gave you to watch were more those aren't something that I would have a student watch those are really professional presentations um, and they were just to give you a a base knowledge, but I'll continue to search through the different resources and find more Oak Woodland specific ones that right. um, could help further educate yourself. Um, and especially the goal with these teacher trainings is to um, preload you with enough information so that as you're teaching this to your students, you feel confident in answering any questions you might have. Right, because I feel, I, can, I feel I can be very helpful not only with students, but with teaching teachers in our area if they want to bring their students to help give them the materials that they would need to work with their students so that the more I can give to teachers, the better for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Thank I'll work on getting another list um, um, there's some been some good presentations lately on fire in the oak woodland, so I can you. send along. I have a I have a question. Uh, I mean, let's assume for a second we get beyond uh, the COVID nineteen isolation. At some point, we're in school again, and I know this has probably disrupted your rollout plan big time. But uh, assuming you're getting down, you're ready to go. Are you planning to take this to districts to try to get this adopted? This or are you depending on teachers becoming interested? I have to tell you, our experience has been. We created this incredible third grade curriculum and offered to teachers before they came to the park for the field trips. And most, I mean, without casting aspersions, most teachers saw this as a day off and weren't interested and basically sent their kids to us and said, go play and barely showed up. And we had a hard time getting teachers involved uh, unless the districts sort of created the program. I was wondering what, what, whether you were going there. So one thing that um, we have been working um, in, in my area with the local county office of education and trying to share information out to the school districts via them but i think it is very much i mean teachers have so much that's preying on their time right, right? and right. it really depends on the teacher um and so what we've experienced so far i'm sure ali will add to this but um you know there are some teachers for whom this is just where they want to be going and um, their interest is peaked from the get-go and they're ready for it. And there are others that kind of need to see a little bit more before they feel like, yes, I think I'd like to take this on. And then there are some for whom it just isn't gonna fit in for their, the way that they are working with their class. And I think we um, are, can be as respectful as possible with that and um, hope that the more it's shared by individual teachers, the more the message will connect throughout the teachers. If it's successful, my experience is that a good lesson gets shared between teachers. Yes. Yeah, and um, just to kind of further expand on that, so our grant period is ending in um, coming this November 1. Mm -hmm. um, our grant will be over. There's other people within UCANR who are taking up the program who um, were kind of specifically hired on through other grants to continue to um, push for the utilization of the fireworks curriculum and spread it to different areas. Um, so I think it'll be something that's used within UCNR. And um, I know that Kate uh, is also considering making a chaparral version um, as part of uh, some things being done in her new position. So it's definitely something that's going to be continued to be worked on um, and shared um, both with districts and um, individual teachers as well as informal educators. I have definitely been working, my background is EE, so I've been working on um, reaching out to the EE community, trying to get it into those science camps, um, all that type of thing. Obviously those are kind of all on hold right now, so it's a little bit harder to push um, as unfortunately they've fired many of their staffs, but um, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Um, any other? Trisha, you have two questions. Let's hear them. Oops, we're not hearing you, Trisha. Trisha, for some reason, it doesn't look like you're muted, but we still can't hear you. Feel free to put questions in the chat, Trisha, if it's going to be hard to do it otherwise. Right. Okay, how's that? Yes. Perfect. Uh, my AirPods died, so I put them to the side. Um, are Hannah, Allie, and Kate, are you available as uh, virtual guest speakers into middle and high school classrooms? Yeah, so um, I'll answer first for Hannah and I, and then I'll let Kate um, do her own answering. Uh, so Hannah and I, um, so my position is right now only funded through the grant. So unfortunately, my my position is ending, um, funnily enough, on my birthday, Halloween. Um, <laughs> but through, through that, I am more than happy to come in if a teacher would like us to run lessons um, virtually for them or to give a presentation. Um, this presentation that Kate gave earlier today, I've been lucky enough to see her give several times and I have also been given it myself um, because I've learned so much from her. Her background is, um, you know, she has a PhD in fire science, so um, definitely um, yeah, so Hannah and I are both, um, depending on schedules, we can talk to each other, but very happy to help um, facilitate doing these lessons with teachers in any way possible. Great. And, and then Trish, Trish, the Trish, second, I, sorry, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. Go on, do your second question and then I can cover it. The second question is, um, I would like to get these kits available at my county school's office to work with three different the Foothill counties, Tuolumne, Calaveras, and Amador. How do we purchase? Can can it just come pre-made and purchased or do I need to build my own? Um, so you're lucky in many ways. The regional forest advisor in that region, Susie Coker, purchased a few trunks too, in wow. fact. So there's two trunks in your region that are supposed to be kind of shared between those counties. What's her name? Susie Coker. I can send you an email, Tricia, with her contact. Who does she, what, what's her connection? Who does she work she's with? University of California Cooperative Extension, and she's a regional forest advisor that serves those regions. Cool. Um, and then in Yay, terms Steven. Of, <laughs> and then in terms of like purchasing kits. Um, well, if she has one for us, then I can work directly with her. Right. I, I would say it took us quite a lot of time to to put the kits together. Yeah. Um, and we did, for the custom built things, we did make extras because we thought other people might want to put it together, make, make more kits. And so um, you could definitely make more kits. They're probably about $800 each to make just for the materials. Okay. Because I also help run the Tuolumne um, Forestry Institute for Teachers. So we might be doing it virtually next summer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who knows? But Anyway, they would love to have a kit available when we train teachers in the summer as well that can move from institute to institute. So anyway, okay, thank you. Trisha, I put Susie's email in the chat. Thank you, Stephanie. And then um, another Forestry Institute for Teachers leader, Ricky Satomi. Yeah, he is um, the leader. Right, he has a kit <laughs> as well. Oh, he does have a kit? Mm -hmm. Oh, he doesn't fantastic. quite have a kit yet. Oh. <laughs> I'm putting together the final touches of the kits. He will have a kit maybe mid-September, as will Susie <laughs> have hers around mid-September, just to give you an idea of timeline. And I think, okay. yeah, just to clarify, that might be why Ali and I are just being slightly vague in specifying exactly which locations they're at. It's because we're still putting quite a lot together. And um, so as soon as we have like a pin down list of good locations, we'll share that with you. But I think what's valuable certainly for um, my area is knowing um, I would like them um, placed at um, locations that are easier, easily accessible, but also that are um, going to use them. 
So if you know that your school is like, yeah, we are taking this on or your school district, then that seems like a great place to be housing a kit. And that could always be shared to other schools where appropriate. I think Susie has most of a kit. Um, she has the ones with the fire physics lessons. I'm just working on putting together the last of the natural materials, which has gotten held up um, partially because for huge chunks of time, I wasn't allowed to go to my office to get to interact with any of the things as is currently the case just because of UCNR rules within different counties that are on the watch list. So it's been a challenge to get these final things together when I'm like, I can't even go and get the laminator to laminate the leaves. Or for a while, I didn't have my plant presses at home. So I was like, I can't even collect these things yet. But um, we're working on it. I, I have a couple Thank questions. You. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so first of all, what would be the approximate cost of a kit? Because I, my local resource conservation district has about twenty-five dollars to $5,000 in funds that they want me to use for environmental education. And I'm thinking that this might be a good program to do. I, I yeah. Think the approximate cost is somewhere between um, 800 to 1100 depending on how savvy of a shopper you are. Okay, that, um, that gives me a good idea. And that's just for materials and not for time. Yeah, yeah. Which is um, important to recognize that some of the elements have a certain amount of time associated with their creation. <laughs> Correct. <Quite> um, <laughs> <laughs> the other question I have is I'm thinking about trying to adapt this, well, for virtual because that's all I'm allowed to do right now. And um, so I'm looking at some of these lessons though, thinking that you, they might need to be done over like two periods when you're doing them virtually. So what mm -hmm. is the normal time frame of going through all the lessons that you would normally do in person? Yeah, so um, with the lessons, we haven't had a single group that has done all three units together, and that's just because they do take a considerable amount of time. Um, I can imagine what we are really trying to get is uh, an after school program to do a trial run because they have all the free time to kind of um, choose what they teach their students. We weren't able to quite do that. Um, I would say a week of class periods um, per unit and perhaps the, the natural and cultural fire ecology would be a little bit longer. So um, Hannah did most of the wildfire preparedness unit um, with a class doing one classroom period every day. Mm -hmm. um, and with the fire physics, the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you, I had to, I did, I think I chopped out some of those lessons that I went through today, but um, it was certainly doable. And then of course, when you move into the phenomena in that interaction, that's when of course that could be a whole other kind of component that you, is a longer term element. Okay, last question. Would you recommend the possibility of skipping between the three different topics as you're putting together like your lesson plan? Yeah, um, so when I've done field trips, because I do, I've done more um, field trips to the rec, and I plan a day as opposed to just one, one lesson unit, and I'll do a couple from here, a couple from, you know, a couple natural and cultural fire ecology, a couple fire physics, and then I often um, always share about communication plans and go bag creation because I feel like that's something all students should be considering. So I kind of pull together different things and um, I, you know, as educators, I feel like you all have an understanding of how to create like a good arc for a learning arc for a day or um, even, you know, for a series. Um, so, you know, it's, once it's out there, it's it's free reign. You can use it however you like. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you so much. Yeah, Henry? Uh, do you have a document that actually sets out sort of the specifications for a kid? What's in it? What, what exactly what it is? If someone wanted to, okay, we want to do these lessons, start with here. So I, what do we need for those lessons and what is involved in producing that particular equipment? Is there a document where you set that all out? Yeah, so the... 
at at each of the beginning of the lessons it says what materials you'll need so if you're thinking about just doing a couple lessons and are curious what materials you would need for that particular lesson i would use the lesson plan itself and the materials list at the beginning i mean more specifically you have a board how thick it is what it's made out of you know the actual what the parts are for putting things together rather than saying you need a burn board for this yeah so um there's a um on the frames website that i sent out before there um there are the lists for the trunks um the sierra nevada trunk the original rocky mountain trunk and eventually our oak woodland trunk list will be there as well um and i believe i have that in a spreadsheet and i could send that to you via email um so you could have that sooner i just have to i could see us how one to start small with something you know and building a kit just for that so we could use it and roll that out and see how that works uh with the, with the kids so we know where we are right. yeah into it. um one thing to note as i started building the kits um it was actually really helpful to have another kit in my hand so i could see how they had done it and so if you are considering like making a kit I would highly recommend borrowing, borrowing one of the kits that has just been made for Oak Woodlands before you embark upon that venture. And Henry, uh, I could certainly help with that. You know, if you, we, we could fairly easily get you our kit to, um, to see. Right. It sounds like there's nothing very difficult to put together. It's just time consuming, of course. But once you get the parts, you're you know, assembling it. So, it's, so uh, Hannah, and, I, uh, I have a question because there's been some great stuff listed in the chat. And what would help me is if I could get that information in an email. Here's the frames. The here's you know here's where I could. So if if if, if you go through and get all of that, so I get in an email saying, oh, there's everything I I wanted to make sure I got written so we'll down. Do, we'll do a follow up email at the end Great. of the series. That will probably be next week. Now I, I no, that's fine. I'm <laughs> none of us. I'm in not that big of a hurry, but that would be great. Yeah, no problem at all because I'd like to go talk to our uh, district superintendent, um, Brock. Great, yeah, and anything I can do to, to support that, please. Yeah, this would be great to get a county-wide Department of Education yeah. sort of our push county, on this. Our county uh, superintendent, he, 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 we know him pretty well and he would be into it, so that'd be great. Right. Okay, any other questions for Kate about fire science or us about anything related? before we close out for the day? I would just I would just like to say that it always saddens me to see this stuff is always so grant oriented. Having dealt with the state parks for many, many, many years, they get a grant, something happens, they do the first two burns, they run out of money, it's all a waste of effort. I mean, it's just so sad that, that this is not being funded on an ongoing basis. It's like something that we have, where you know it's gonna come out the other end rather than having these wonderful spurts of energy, we sort of go, okay, it's, Ah, I hope we hope you have a great life. You know, I don't know where it goes. So it seems like the way it is. Though. It's just uh, I can see it having the COVID thing in the middle of all this is sort of, you know, altered uh, its trajectory. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I would say though, Henry. Also, there is a great appetite for this. Um, yes. And so I, you know, to to balance that out, I think. Um, there's a lot of people with a lot of interest in this right now. So that, that's coming from the educational point of view of this series and this grant. I, I wonder if you were speaking more broad, broadly about... Um, yeah, that's more broadly on the fire efforts and efforts in general. They seem to be so grant time delineated. Okay, you've got this much money and this time to do that and then it ends. And there yeah. may or may not be someone who picks it up at the other end. Sort of well, we're... St um, we're still just very grateful because without the grant, it wouldn't have happened oh, yeah. at all. Um, Nothing happens so, without the grants. Right. Yeah, we were really lucky. Um, the EPA Environmental Education Grants, um, there's only four people awarded uh, for um, wow. Unit 10, Unit 10, Section 10. Mm -hmm. I forget what the qualifier is on that. For the Area 10 is California... Hawaii, um, I believe Oregon and maybe Nevada, and there's hundreds of applicants. And um, so, you know, I just want to recognize because they're both here and you all are here to listen to this, but um, Kate and Hannah 
and I definitely all worked our butts off. And we also just had a program that happened to really fit the time. We turned right. this in, um, you know, not long after the campfire happened. Um, so it, it was just the right project at the right time. And so we're really grateful to the EPA. Well, I am so impressed by what you guys have done. I have to tell you, this is a massive endeavor. I, mean, it's, I can't imagine the hours and hours and hours and hours of work. That went, I mean, it's just incredible when you see something. So you have produced something that's going to live on at any rate. It's, it's really a, it's a wonderful thing to see, really. It's very impressive. Yes. And Henry, just one really important thing to note is that this is really part of a much larger fireworks program that actually right. has a paid director in the Forest Service. Ah. And so oh, fireworks as you know, a curriculum was born in the Rocky Mountain Research Lab in, over in Missoula, Montana. But now there's like 10 or 12, I don't know, maybe 20 now have been proposed yeah. different curriculums. And so, you know, it's still going, it's still there, the curriculums, you know, talk to one another and build upon what the others have done. And so in that way, I, there's a lot of continuity in these ideas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Anything else before we go? Um, we'll see you all back tomorrow at 10. We have another great guest speaker coming to talk about trauma-informed education and um, ways to help um, manage um, 